So I'm making this video today for two reasons, really. The first one is, um, if you have a guitar set up by me at Reel of Guitars, and I send it back to you, and when you come to play it, you are horrified to find some buzz has crept back in to the guitar. Um, don't panic. Now, the reason why not to panic is as follows. When you set low playing actions on guitars, you probably know that you have to level the frets to be able to achieve it. So there's a low playing action. But even when you've leveled the frets, to get that low playing action, you're, the lower the action you have, the more susceptible you are to changes in environment. So for example, temperature or humidity, which causes wood, this old unreliable stuff, to react and behave in different ways. So if you have a high action guitar, I can send it from my environment to yours. And even if the neck changes a tiny bit, uh, in the, during the journey or somewhere either end, uh, it, it doesn't matter because the action may, may be high enough so that the changes in the neck are masked or hidden. However, the lower the action that we have, and most of my customers want a very low action, the more susceptible, as I've said, we are to slight changes in the neck. Now, the important thing about this to remember is some people um, think, wait a minute, I've paid to have the guitar set up and now I've got it back and opened it up after, maybe after a couple of days in the box or straight away even and for some reason a buzz, some kind of buzz has, has crept in and I'm really disappointed because I thought, um, A, I thought I'd paid for it to be set up really well. It's very rare this happens but I'm, I'm kind of putting this as a, a kind of disclaimer so that you can be informed and also to help you learn something about your guitar. Um, but occasionally you might find that happens, very rarely, but occasionally you find that happens. Um, and you think, oh, it, it doesn't play well, I've got some buzz suddenly, what do I do? Um, I've already paid to have it set up, I don't want to be tw tinkering with it. I, I'm, I'm a bit miffed or disappointed. Um, now the thing to remind you at that point is, uh, to reiterate, as I've said, the lower the action we go, the more susceptible the neck or the, the playing action is to any changes in the neck and we can't control those it's out of my hands and it's out of your hands all I can do is level the frets and set the guitar up to as low a playing action as I can get in this environment now to if it does happen to you and you take the guitar out of the box at the other end and this is let's say this has happened to you then first of all don't panic there are two things to do the first one okay is to or well, before we do them <laughs> The first thing to do is to remember this, is that if I've set the guitar up, there are three major components of what I call the playing action. The first is the first fret action, or not in any particular order. Let's call the first one is the amount of curvature and relief there is in the neck. Okay, that's the, that's the first of three important variables, and it's, it, it's whether your neck has got any curvature in it all the way down it, right? So the relief of your neck is the first of the three variables. The next one is what I call the last fret height, and that's of course set by where we put the bridge, whether it's higher or lower, or if it's a Strat style, the individual saddles. The third of the three is what I call the first fret action, and that is the clearance above the first fret of the strings. So it's setting the gap, and I do this very often, either with a adjustable custom made of adjustable tusk nut or I do it with a very carefully cut solid nut of that kind like a tusk thing. So those are the three major components. Now in transit that one won't wind itself down. It's under pressure. I don't slacken the strings off so there's no way this will somehow wind itself down. Once in a million years it might happen if I fiddle with it and done something and accidentally forgotten and then put it in the packing and away it goes. But it's almost impossible for that to happen. This one also doesn't uh, undo, or a fixed nut certainly doesn't undo, it stays exactly where it was. So for example, this kind of nut here requires a little hex key to turn it. So I'd have to turn that hex key, which is quite stiff, um, in order to change the first fret action. 
So if between me sending it to you and you getting it back, this guitar develops some sort of buzzing, the only one that's outside of my control and that is likely to change, that's the word likely I'm using um, advisedly, is entirely possible and, and quite likely to change to some degree is the curvature of the neck. Now, on a dry day or in a dry environment, for all I know, um, the neck may, having set a tiny bit of relief, we may suddenly find it's gone flat. Okay, I've got you right where the reflection is, so that's terrible. So yeah, it might turn completely flat. Now the tiny low action we've chosen to play on this guitar may be just still high enough to allow that to play flat. But if something, if we start off very flat to begin with, or nearly flat to begin with, and the weather or the humidity or temperature changes, what we can get is the neck doing this, which becomes what we call back bowed. And if that happens, this is your nut, and this is your bridge end, and this is the midpoint. Very often, as soon as it gets very flat or slightly beyond flat to the convex, what we lose is all the notes down here. They start to choke and buzz. And very often, that is what you will find if there's going to be any change, and if the guitar sounds buzzy when you get it, it's almost certainly going to be a small change in the neck from either nearly flat to dead flat, and we haven't got enough room for the strings to move, or from what was nearly flat or almost flat to slightly back bowed if it's changed quite a lot. And thin necks like this one can change more than certain chunky necks can. So let's say you've had that happen to you and you're feeling kind of um, a bit freaked out and you think, oh, it's, uh, it's suddenly um, stopped or suddenly doesn't make a, a nice sound. In fact, what I'm going to do is, well, let's demonstrate it right here. So I'll, I'll talk uh, or try and describe what's going on as I demonstrate. Let's take the truss rod cover off. Now, one of the reasons I'm making this video, I, there were two reasons. The first one was to um, let you know what, what is entirely possible to have happen as a customer of, of, customer of mine when I set up your guitar and it comes back to you in a possibly different day, different environment, different weather, different part of the world, who knows. Um, but it, it can absolutely be subject to changes in its um, in the neck shape. And that's the place where you will get some buzz creeping back in because we are working with those low playing actions. So let me just let me just take this guitar and let me do something that I know is going to cause it. And I'll tell you what I'm doing later, but let's do it first. So I've done set the guitar up nicely and it comes back to you. And uh, let's say it's still got this on, right? You've taken it out of the box. I'm going to see if this does this. And we play it. Oh yeah, lovely. So I'm going to try and zoom. Um, it's hard to see what I'm seeing. No, that's the other way around. It's hard to see what you're seeing, but I'm going to try and do it. So let's go down to there. Okay, so we, we go to play it, and I think I've set it up beautifully. Now down the far end, things play, but suddenly, that's horrible. I mean, it's sort of playing, but listen to those. They're not playing at all. Now you know, but just before I did that, I did a little tweak on the truss rod to, to set it up in this condition, but that tweak sometimes can happen by virtue of the weather. And I want, I'm, trying to, I'm going to try and demonstrate to you how tiny an adjustment it takes. Now, the reason, second re first reason I'm doing this video is so that if you get a guitar back from me and it has changed very slightly in the, your climate and it suddenly has a buzz that I couldn't predict because I couldn't predict the neck changing, um, then don't panic and here's how you check for it. Well, the first way you can check for it is play those notes and that will tell you that mm, I think this neck is either totally flat or gone back bowed. And the way you test it is this. Let's take a zoom out. So uh, I'm going to get around to saying the second reason. The first reason is so you can test it and the, the second reason is so is you can put it right. And in putting it right, I'm going to encourage you and show you to, to manipulate the truss rod and lose your fear of it because far too many people think it's something they shouldn't be adjusting and it's absolutely not true. Because of this 
business with low action and weather or environment, you have to be able to adjust it because the truss rod is there for you to counter the natural changes of the guitar uh, neck throughout the seasons and depending on the string loading you put on it. So if you think about what happened, I set up a guitar um, which played when I sent it off and it's come to you and suddenly it doesn't play and you're hearing sounds like this. So the thing you want, I want you to suspect is not the nut because it can't move, not the bridge because it can't move. The only other thing that can have changed, unless it's broken in the box, which I do my utmost to make sure it never does, and out of about 1,600 or so courier sends, I've never had, a, had one broken or lost. Um, so it's neither of those two things. The only thing that would, could possibly change is the shape of the neck. So we've got this buzzing, you don't like it. My first invitation to you is to check for whether your neck is flat, uh, back bowed or relieved. And the way you do this is quite simple. You can either do it with two hands or you can do it with a capo, which I'll bring over here if you've got one. But let's do it with just the bare hands. So what I want you to do is put your, hold down the low E string on the last fret with this pointy finger and with your little finger of the other hand, hold down that same string on the first fret. So you're making a straight line between those two points and the string becomes the straight line. Okay, now what you should have, if your guitar, as I sent it to you, if it stayed the same, you should have a very small gap at the halfway point. Now, I don't really need to, that's seven, that's eight fret. We call it eight fret, but sometimes it's nine, you know, it's about halfway, right? You just pick a fret halfway, call it number eight, and what you do is you look for a gap between the string and that uh, fret. Now, what I'm going to do while we're here, I'm going to put this capo on here because if you've got one you can do that to hold that one down and I'm going to try oh, smack it into the guitar, I'm going to try and get a close-up from the angle that I can see it which is not going to be easy so let's try it okay where's the eighth fret oh somewhere like that now don't know if you can see this but that that's the seventh fret we're looking at there I think but anyway so there's the eighth fret and I think you might be able to see, if I can hold it still, that is touching, right? That string is touching the fret, so there's no gap at all. So that's the first way. Oh, I'll get the camera back. Come on, camera. That's the first way of checking. That's the first check you need to do. And what I suggest is when you do that, whether capoing it like this and, and checking, um, when you do that check, you'll almost certainly find, if you've got that fret buzz, you'll almost certainly find that suddenly there's no gap here. Now, I can assure you there was, because I set it um, when, I, when it left here. Now, that means the neck has changed in shape during transit, okay? And it's taken away the tiny bit of clearance. Now, the problem is, is if I set it high enough to withstand that, you wouldn't have the experience of playing a very low, fast neck, because... Uh, a low fast neck requires a low action at both ends and a flat neck and level frets for it all to work. And of course, it requires that the neck relief stays the way I set it. And if it does change, and it possibly will change during the year, it therefore means to maintain a good low action that you're happy with, you've got to be comfortable making those adjustments because you have to accept that it will potentially and very likely change. So here we are, we've had that change. We've, we've ascertained by holding down that low E on the first and last fret and checking for a gap in the middle. You can usually hear it. It's not really. It, there's about a thousandth of a millimeter there, but it's for all intents and purposes, it's touching. Um, in fact, it's, it's as good as it is touching. I'm probably just making it bounce off there. So we've got, suddenly we've got no relief in the neck and we know as a rule it needs some. So we're going to have to put some back in. Now this raises the question that people always ask, which is how much do you need? Oh, another way of putting it is how much did I send it out with? And the answer that's not going to be satisfying to begin with is a tiny bit more than none. Now, what do I really mean by that? Well, I'll get a uh, feeler gauge and I'll tell you that in reality it's about 0.15, something like that, of a millimeter at that same position. But right now we know we've got none. So we're going to have to make an adjustment now, we're in your environment, and let's Im imagine that it's for now it's relatively stable. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the first adjustment to regain some curvature. 
and it's really simple to do. And this is the bit that I want, in a way, I want this video to be most about, which is about you overcoming your fear of the truss rod. So to get into this, let's have a kind of look at the truss rod. Um, I've probably got one here I can show you as well. Oh, look, I happen to have one for a simple reason. That some of you will know that I use one as a special kind of fret leveling device. But um, what I'll do for the time being, I'll just take the paper off that one so it looks a bit more like a standard truss rod so I can show you. Ignore this a bit of sticky paper on the back of there. So your truss rod is a device that lives underneath the fingerboard uh, and kind of embedded in a little route, a channel that runs along the top of the wood of the neck. And on top of that, sits the glued on fingerboard and the truss rod this object here usually something looking very much like this um, and you can all the paper on there it's, it's got a metal bar attached to a rod welded to a rod and it's welded at both ends okay and what that does is that when that's sitting in there like so when you turn this thing it causes i probably get i could probably get you to see it um, let's have a look if we can reproduce the action of it. So here, if we look down it, can you see that's relatively straight, okay? If I get the adjuster and I crank it hard to the right or clockwise, you will probably get to see quite quickly what I've done. See that? Mm, sorry about the angle. I've caused it to bend. So what I've done is I've pulled the, um, I've pulled the, this end bit here further down the, ro the threaded rod and it's shortened that distance but what it can't do is shorten this bar so it has to bend the bar outwards and that bend there is what causes your uh, effect affects your fingerboard on your neck actually and causes it to bend um, the way you want it to so that's in simple terms how a truss rod works I'm just going to undo this so you saw that was about half a turn of the truss rod and it bent that much. Now it's going to bend less when it's in the wood because it's kind of snugly fitted in. Now looking back at this, what you need to know about the truss rod is, first of all, it's very difficult to break. Some people insist they've broken them and they'll, they may have one that snaps off or shears off. So if we look at this truss rod, uh, I'm, I'm going counterclockwise as if I was slacking it off but eventually on this kind of truss rod there are slightly different kinds there are some that are positive in both directions so if I turn it counterclockwise it bends the other way but this one's a sort of standard one that, that curves when you tighten it up and then just goes to slack when you undo it and when you undo it even further off comes this thing you can see the threaded rod there uh, you can see the weld holding the um, rod to the bar um, and this bit here, the, the, hard to show you, but the rod goes through this bit here. It goes through this little tunnel here. So the rod, uh, when you put this bit back on, this adjuster, onto the threaded bit, what happens is, as you tighten it up, it pulls itself and pushes against this piece here, which goes that way. Um, and it can go that way, but it pushes the bar with it, which can't uh, move as such can't change place so what it does is bends outwards as it does it okay and that's what we've got in this guitar and, and many other kinds the only kind you'll find that's different is uh, majorly different is the kind that um, is positive in both directions the one in this one is positive only in the tightening bending way and then it it undoes until it goes slack and the reason I guess behind that is that this classic version um, it's the idea of the guitar is that the string loading will pull the curvature in the neck and the idea of the truss rod, the design of the truss rod, is for you to um, counteract that tendency for the neck to curve under the string loading. And so really all they design them for is for you to um, tighten it up to counteract the curve and to flatten the neck out. And then if you wanted more curve, the idea is that you would go counterclockwise and it would eventually go slack but by which time they would be curved back in your neck now if you remember um, we knew that there was a problem with the shape of the neck by two things first of all by these choked out notes at this half of the neck not up here though notice that's the telltale if it's choked out there but playable up here it's usually back bow it's 
the fact that it's gone convex. So if it's gone convex, um, we need to slack it to, to allow the strings to pull a little bit of curvature back into it. So what I really want you to hear, see and hear now is how little or much I need to do to regain those notes to give us back a perfect playing guitar that you, and you could do it. So we have our 4 mil hex key here, right? And I'm going to just gently wiggle it into position. It's not a, it's, all, it's, it's a bit unscientific. You have to, you tend to, it gets in the way of the string. So there's only usually one place you can get it into the thing and then you find it sticking up. So you can't turn it much anyway. But now let's do a five degree or 10 degree turn. See, it's a bit of slack in there, but it will turn now. Watch this. So I reckon that's about 10 degrees I turned. Okay. Um, it should make its adjustment straight away. And the reason we'll know if it has or hasn't is listen to these notes. Coming back. Still a little bit there. So that was that simple. Your ears and a tiny adjustment in the right direction. Okay. Now let's do the tiny bit more because we know we've got a fraction more to go. And I'm going to do another 10 degrees. I'm making it up 10 degrees like that. Whatever you want to call it. 10 degrees. Let's have a feel. There you go. So in two little, maybe 20 degrees of turn, counterclockwise, slacking this off, um, in slacking it, I've I've relaxed the truss rod, so it's relaxing its countering of the string that, that was happening, and it allows the string to bend the neck a little bit more into a bit more relief. So that solved the problem, and that is as simple as it has to be. We still got overall a very low action and a very low, um, yeah, just a low and light action with as flat a neck as is possible for this setup. See that? Now, just to prove it to you, okay, let's go back the 20, uh, 40 degrees. No, 20 degrees? Two tens, wasn't it? Something like that. So let's go back again, right? Count, uh, we'll go clockwise this time. 10. Twenty. You you wouldn't be able to see the difference it's made. Ta -da. That's all I want to. I mean, that's the main thing I want you to get is that that little bit of adjustment. Look how comfortable I am doing it. As many times now, you might say. Oh God, uh, have I remembered where I started and where I finished? Well, come on, let's go an extreme. Ugh. Let's crank it to a ridiculous extreme. Wow, that's about, what, 40 more degrees? Now, question is, will you even be able to see the uh, distortion of the neck now? Hard to see, but actually, funnily enough, that's, that's back bowed. Okay, trust me. Okay, you could see it by the test that we did earlier. Um, well, actually, you can't... You can't detect the, the back bow by doing that test. You can tell it's flat. Um, and if it's flat, you can assume it's back bowed as well. But we do it there. There's absolutely no space at all. We'll play all the notes up to the, up to around the middle are compromised more than before. So that back bowing has uh, continued to dial in. It's now made the neck go from flat to, or slightly accurate the way or the way it should have been with a little bit of um, relief it's gone flat and passed flat to backbone and now we can't play anything it's like somebody's holding them down it's like they're touching something here it's not in playing the open strings so you don't adjust those two at all all you do is you get comfortable now you might say how do i know how much i've turned it this way well do you remember what i said you go back until there's a tiny bit more than none right so we go back I don't even know, need to count it. Let's have a play. Not enough. Let's go back. And I'm just, I'm just sort of guessing it now. I can't remember, remember how much I did it up. Now, can you hear the... It's playing. 
Oh, it should be next to the microphone, sorry. Playing, but not well. It's still got that little hint of going on in it. So, a bit more. Now, that I would say that is as little as you can get away with, but you can go loads more, right? This is now, let's go all the way to the slack position. Oh, is it going to slack or is it going to go from, It's got to be slack. It can't physically go the other way, can it? Or am I losing my marbles? What have we got there? I've got loads of relief. Now, this is weird. That's supposed to come out, isn't it? How's that one working? Oh, no, it's the other one. This is a two-way one. Sorry. I'm thinking about the one I just played. This is a two-way one. Fine. Okay, that other one I showed you is a one-way. This one is working positively in the other direction. Now, let's have a look and see if I can show you uh, what it's done now. I don't know if you can see. Do you see the... Oh, it's hard. It's really hard to see. Meh. I don't know. Can you sort of see the curvature there's a lot of curve in there okay so what you'll get when you put loads of curve into it if I can zoom out what you'll get with loads of curve into it and then, like I said this is a, a positive in both directions truss rod which is great so amazingly what do you notice it's detuned right because we've now gone whoop, and in going like that we've pushed the nut end a little bit closer to the bridge end and we've relieved or uh, reduce the tension so it's detuned but suddenly everything plays but what we've got if we look from the eyeball view we've got I didn't do it the other way I'll show you again in a minute so let's look at well, should we look at the ninth fret so look at the ninth fret look how high that is Okay, and if I were to put on the capo, sorry about this camera jump, jumping around, it's, I've only got one set of hands, unfortunately. Let's, let's check it the way we checked at the beginning. Um, holding down the first and last fret and looking at fret number nine. Wow, look at that. Can you see how much space? There's about, there's about a millimetre and three quarters. That's a massive amount of relief. And the way you'd measure that is by, obviously I've taken my hand off there so it's an unnaturally large gap. But if you really want to get precise, you can get your old feeler gauge and, and hook it under there. I'll do it from another angle because it's impossible. Hold the camera and do it. So, so, so now look at that. Sam's messed up his lovely setup. It's got a, it's got, you know, it's all over the place. It seems like a mile high. Now the thing about your truss rod is I've totally messed the setup up, set up, up. But I've done it by just adjusting, just adjusting up, up by one thing, and that's the curvature of the neck. I haven't touched these at all. But adjusting the curvature too much gives me too much relief, and it not only makes it detune, but it does another thing that's um, weird: is that it makes the playing action near the middle feel very deep. In fact, it actually reduces as you get up here because this straight string is going over the top of a curve. So. The highest point of the action it, down here is actually higher than it is up there, but it feels awful to play. Now, one of the things that people sometimes do is when you hear them on forums and stuff, they go, somebody says, I've got, a, I've got an action I don't like on my guitar, and somebody says, oh, grab your truss rod and adjust it until you get the action you want. Let me be really clear about this. The, whilst adjusting the truss rod clearly does change the action, right, as we've shown here, I want you to think about it is not that is not its primary function right and if you need to adjust your action you don't adjust it by going to the truss rod the truss rod first and foremost is your device to dial in only as much relief as little relief as your playing action can get away with right that's all it's for get that into your head it's not for setting the action you set the action with these two things and of course that's ultimately um, governed by whether you've got even frets under here and if you really want a low action as you know from watching my videos you have to address the uneven frets with fret leveling but the action is adjusted by 
fret leveling and these two points here, lowering the first fret action and lowering the last fret action via the bridge. It is not done first and foremost by adjusting your truss rod, although adjusting the truss rod will cause a change in action, but it's a secondary effect. But keep it in mind this way round because you'll stay straight on the straight and narrow. So let's go back to where I want it. How much, act, how much relief do I need? Right, I am too bowed now, I need to straighten it out. So let's crank it this way. And I'm going to crank it until, again, funnily enough, it goes flat. So I'm going past the middle point here on this two-way truss rod. And I'm going to put a little bit of um, pull on it. And I'm just going to check it. So I'm, going to, I'm sort of che cheating because I could check it like this, which I can. And I can see an absolutely tiny gap. So even when the gap, as measured here, the relief curve is minuscule, it's still enough to let this chosen action play. The result of that is that around here it will feel fantastic in conjunction with the low action I've already dialed in. Now slightly out of tune from where I had it before, and that tells you I'm, I'm a tiny bit off my original setting, and it it's probably won't go back to perfect tune anyway because I'm toing and froing with this not the tuners but the point here is that your first thing you do if you, if you get it back from me and it needs doing you go through the process i've just shown you um, or if you're setting one up yourself you set your neck relief first which i'm going to do here and typically so i would do a little bit more curve so i slack off counterclockwise to relax it counterclockwise a tiny bit more i would get a noticeable little bit of action that's still almost none. Um, so, you know, stick with it. You can go a bit beyond it, but because you can go almost flat. If you've got level frets, you can. This thing. I can't really see what's turning now. Okay, a little, a little click, a little bit of relief. You see, that's where I was. It's back in tune. That's not bad. So I've got my little bit of relief. Then. I, adjust, I recommend you set your last fret action here to whatever you prefer. I have a setting from 1.5 millimeters, 1 1.45, 1 1.4, 1.35, 1.3, 1.2. I go down from 1.5 to 1.2 on this last fret, uh, and I go to 0.3 here, right? And I'm hoping that, or it totally probably turns out that with those all done and with my um, tiny bit of relief showing here it's less than in fact it's barely one point uh, sorry barely 0.15 and in fact it's just about 0.15 so that's how it tends to work out and that as it happens has gone back into tune which tells me it was where i started out earlier on today before i brought this up here to demonstrate so the key things to remember you can't break your truss rod, or you almost certainly can't break it. And I'll give you an example. I mean, this is a truss rod that's outside of the guitar, okay? So that's not, I'll tell you what, hold, hold fire. I've done this before. Let's do it again. Uh, let's find a neck that I don't mind or don't care too much about. <laughs> oh dear. Um, let's find something horrible. What's this one? Oh yes, that's pretty horrible. I don't even know if I can see into the truss, uh, the hex key adjuster on here. Look, a gear for music neck. Right. Okay, gear for music neck. Somebody's leveled this in the past. It wasn't me, was it? Surely not. Anyway, gear for music neck. Let's see if we can break this truss rod. So I'm going to tighten it. And what we'll get probably is a nice big crazy curve. In other words, back bowed. <sighs> so the first thing you end up with is a, a neck that's banana shaped. I don't know if you can see that. That's pretty curvy. Now I'm going to see if I can break it. I don't really care. Is that the wrong four and five or four? That's five. I've got the wrong one. They always the the spanner ones always look a size. Stay always look a size out. No, they don't. They are size out. Hmm. Maybe they don't like to work when you 
unless you can get a flat run on them. Anyway, let's see if we can break it. Let's get, let's get a bite in here. Well, you you can you can surely I'm going to get showing this by hand. And that is about as about as crazy bent as you're going to get. See that? Yikes! See that? I'm I'm cranked that into oblivion. This I don't even know if it's twisted, but that's a crappy neck that I don't care about. Um, but I haven't managed to break it. <laughs> okay, so you can see I am absolutely. You can hear it sort of cre creaking in there because I'm putting it under massive pressure. Now, the one thing it might do <coughs> is spring off. If the glue's weak, it might pop off the old what's it. Or, I've known in the past, because it's under pressure now, if I dropped it on the floor face down, it's quite likely that the glue joint ping, will pop off. It's actually not a bad way of getting thing, the, the fingerboard off. But the trouble is, usually you want to get the fingerboard off because the truss rod isn't working, and so you can't do that. But there you go, you've got an absolutely, massively, it's not a very flat surface to demonstrate it on, but had this not got a nut on here, you would actually be able to see me going like this. So, proof you can't break it, okay? And that was, let's come back to zero on this, that was, <coughs> that was, what, 180? Not quite. Well, let's call it 180 for now. 180. Get in there. 180. <sighs> Not 360, but you know, let's call this about 360 there. So you can see I'm I'm going round twice in that direction. Okay, so and now we're flat again. So that's how hard you can mistreat a truss rod and it's unlikely to do you any major damage. And you, of course, in doing the adjustments here, we did nothing at all anywhere near as hard as that. So I want you to take it from me. First of all, not to be afraid of doing it. You really can't break your truss rod, no matter what those people have told you in forums. You can't break it. If it changes in, if you get buzz in the first half of the net after you've got it back from me it'll be because the neck has flattened out slightly and you do the test to see if it has by holding down the first fret and the last fret and touching or checking the gap in between and if it's none at all then it's flattened out and all you need to do is to counterclockwise a very small amount until there is enough gap only enough gap to play those notes and that's playing the way you know that's as little as you can get away with for what you for your playing action that we've I've set for you okay so those are the key messages of this video the other thing to to do is I highly recommend you get any one of your guitars and do exactly what I've just done to it in your own time right sit down you can't mess anything up you aren't going to touch any of the other parts of it you're not going to adjust anything else you're just going to play with the truss rod um, sit down and change it and see what happens for yourself, right? See what happens, what the neck feels like when it goes flat in combination with where you've got this action set. See what happens when you um, put it into a big curve and see how much space there is here and how uncomfortable it feels and tiring it feels to play. And feel everything in between. Go the other way, go until it, it's back bowed in a hump and you can't play notes. Hear what happens as the notes disappear until they pretty much disappear all the way up to about here and then dial them back out until they come back so you know the point at which they come back and when there's just a bit of buzz left in and then you can take that little turn more in the counterclockwise direction and you'll get the whole note back and it will be lovely and clean but because you know you're just on the edge of it being um, only just curved enough for, for it to play properly then what you know is that it may change in the autumn or something or in the fall when your uh, weather changes but this time you'll know then if it flattens out a tiny bit more you'll suddenly notice this is choking and you go ah I know that truss rod in tiny 10 degrees of a circle uh, counterclockwise listen play the notes listen check look for any space opening up back there, and you go, ah, I can hear the click, there's a space. Or if you could hear it the way um, we did a minute ago, uh, or see it the way we saw it a minute ago, there'd be a great big gap. Now, just to show you the kind of action 
when the relief is set nice and low, this is um, the, act, the overall action, so it's really low all the way down the neck, okay, in conjunction with the, uh, the nut and the, saddle, uh, the saddles. So we've got an overall low action. But remember, to get that, we have to have a low action here, which is usually limited by the uneven frets. That's what prevents you lowering these actions to their optimum. Usually what prevents you lowering that one is the uneven frets, but this one accounts too. So to get a low action, you want to set it low to a, uh, I do it to a figure I know works every time, and then I um, set the tiny bit of relief, and the watchword is only enough, just enough to make your chosen low action play, as we've done here. Ta -da. Uh, and then what you might find as you're setting up the guitar, you might find then that notes up here are choking, and that would be because there are uneven frets. And so, as I do on every setup, you have to then um, level out the frets. And I do it with the strings on, so I know exactly when the um, uneven fret is cleared and that the chosen action will play. Okay, so I hope that helps you understand what to do when you get a guitar back from me in the unlikely event that the um, weather changes and the neck flattens out. Um, alternatively, by the way, if it, if it seems like a really high action here, you won't hear any buzzing out, but you'll go, I thought you set a low action. And I would recommend, if you think there's something odd about that, do that check again. And if it's suddenly more than, e if it's more than a 0.15, now I know you aren't used to seeing it the way I am, but if it looks anything like a millimeter, it's too high, and what your neck has done is a bit of that. And at that point, I would recommend you get get up person up close and personal with your truss rod adjuster, right? Um, because you're going to need to in future. And once you're not frightened of it, and you can make that adjustment to any guitar that you own, you'll be liberated. And I'll tell you that the difference that adjustment makes between, let's say you heard a minute ago that 0.15 relief that I've got in there now, plus about two millimeters, they both play. One is hateful and un totally unlovable, and the other one, like this, feels like a guitar I want to play all day long. So that tiny, relatively tiny amount of difference measured in a, you know, just as a result of cranking the truss rod makes a huge experiential difference. Um, and I think that that alone should encourage you to overcome your any reluctance or um, yeah, any worry about um, adjusting the truss rod. You can't break it. I hope I've demonstrated that live. I didn't, you know, I've just randomly picked that neck from a load of spares out there, and I couldn't break it by adjusting the truss rod, and you saw me cranking it hard. So don't be afraid. Get stuck in. Most importantly, get you get to feel where the right spot is for you, and don't go for the truss rod to adjust your playing action. That is a secondary consequence of controlling the curvature in the neck in for the purpose of setting as little as your chosen action can get away with. Thanks for watching, I hope that was useful. Um, I will put this video as a link um, in all my um, to and fro -y emails that I send uh, to prospective customers so that they understand this as we start out from the beginning so I don't have to kind of explain it later on and, and also so they can I can point to the link and they can go back and um, look at it. Uh, if you like this kind of thinking um, and how to set up your guitar, consider s subscribing to my channel. Um, never ask people to do that. Consider even liking it. I never ask people to do that. So if you liked it, like it for me. Um, and the other thing you can do is if you go to my Reloved Guitars Facebook page, just search Reloved Guitars on Facebook um, and have a look at the pinned post there, which is about my two ebooks. One of the first one, a um, very popular one, um, the, the oldest one is. Uh, um, five uh, steps to guitar setup heaven and it will show you how to do the not only the setup I do but also the precision fret leveling which I I use a uh, an adjustable uh, truss rod uh, to, as a, a leveling beam to level the guitar with the neck under load and the strings on and actually in in eight years of doing that I've I've learned an awful lot about that system and the one thing this method that I I've kind of promoted over this DIY method, if you like, over the years has proven is that um, when you level frets on a neck with the strings off and the neck relaxed, you are not taking into account 
the longitudinal compression that is at play on the neck when it's strung. And actually, I've found over the years that that, I used to think it was about maybe a five, just clutching at statistics, you know, about a 5% difference in accuracy to do it this way. And there were other reasons that I do it this way besides that. There are many other reasons. But in terms of the accuracy, I was confident that it was about 5% more accurate than, you know, the kind of standard way you see people doing it on YouTube. Actually, in the eight years I've been doing this, I would say it's easily 15, possibly some guitars even 20%. Because the compression, when the thing is strung, pushes, bunches the frets differently from when you level them flat. If you, if you level them all nice and flat, with the neck re um, relaxed and deliberately flattened out, as soon as you uh, load the neck up again with strings, that lovely le relative levelness of the frets is all suddenly bunched and interfered with. And it can be as much as 15 to 20% different, I've found, through experience. Um, so it's really great system. I use it. I've used it for the last eight years non-stop and I continue to use it. I've not found a better way to do it. So if you're interested in that, Five Steps to Guitar Setup Heaven ebook, $24.99 direct from me, please. You can buy it on Amazon and iBooks if there's still such a thing, Apple Store, whatever. Um, but App, App, Mr. Apple and Mr. Amazon get a rather large chunk of the money if you buy it from there. But if you want to buy it direct from me to support me, that would be great. And um, you can find a pinned page or a pinned post on my reloved Facebook page showing you how to do that and showing you all the reviews or some of the reviews people have left for it. Anyway, thank you for the, giving me the time to do a bit of shameless self-promotion. Don't normally do it. Um, see you again soon. Hope that was useful. <laughs>